So we will jump right over to our second breakout session of the day um, about fire and integrated care delivery um, by Patrick Murda. Patrick is a chief interoperability architect and fellow at Humana. Uh, in that role, he provides interoperability strategy and architecture to achieve, to achieve integrated care delivery. Patrick has more than 20 years in health IT and actively participates in industry initiatives, including acting as co-chief architect of ONC's Fire at Scale Task Force, FAST, and as member of the Da Vinci Coordinating Committee and Architecture Team. He is co-inventor on two patents related to payer business rules management and implementations of payer-generated clinical insights in EHR workflow. So uh, Patrick, um, the time is all yours. All right, thank you, Spencer. And uh, I've got to say, uh, first of all, welcome uh, for everybody to the, the conference today. I hope you're having a great conference. And, you know, I've never looked at myself in green before, but I'm kind of digging it. I kind of like the green effect, so I might use yeah. that going forward. Yeah, we like um, it. We like it. Um, and that's compliment of Shelby, our, our Shelby Page, our event designer. She made those. All right, that's good stuff. So again, uh, welcome, everybody. I hope you're having a great conference. We've got a lot of exciting material to cover today. Um, and again, I want to thank you, Hen, for bringing us together. You know, it's uh, in, the, in the world of COVID-19, you know, we've all switched to virtual conferences and those types of things. And the ability to share information and learn from each other is very, very critical. So we certainly appreciate the opportunity to come present to you today some really, really exciting material. So before I jump in, I do want to do a couple of quick caveats. I've got a lot of slides. And the reason for that is that I'm going to go uh, pretty quickly on some of these as we're going through the, the session today. Um, but I do want folks after the, you know, after the conference and as Spencer indicated for up to six months, that you have stuff to go back and reference. So even if I gloss over or quickly go over some of these slides today, never fear, we're going to hit some of the core material. Um, and then you'll have material that you can review offline and certainly hit me with any questions or comments or anything that you need after the session today. Um, I also appreciate the fact that we have probably a little bit of a varied audience. So some of my material is very introductory in nature as it relates to fire and where some of the things are going from an industry perspective. A little bit drops down into the technical components of it. So depending upon your background and your perspective, some of this may seem very, very basic. Hopefully most of it will be very intriguing, but just keep in mind that we've got a broad audience. We wanna make sure that everybody has a good baseline. Uh, Spencer, if you're, or Shelby, if you could go to the next slide, please. You know, quickly from, just from a topics perspective, we're gonna, you know, walk through basically um, why the material as it relates to fire and contemporary interoperability is important. Do a quick refresher on interoperability in general, talk about APIs and why they're, they're, they seem to take on a mystical uh, aura today. To talk about fire, talk about why now and who's involved, and then give a couple of examples and maybe drive into a little bit of a discussion in Q&A if I can speak quickly and, and hopefully have some time at the end. So just to kind of set the stage, and I appreciate that folks uh, as part of the, you know, you Hen, are probably very familiar with some of the challenges that we have as it relates to healthcare interoperability, but I do like to throw this slide up there for folks that, you know, generally understand that we've got you know, an issue in healthcare as it relates to interoperability, but also make it very real in the sense that how much are we actually putting a burden on healthcare, not only from a human perspective, but from a cost perspective as it relates to not sharing information exactly when it's needed during the encounter for the right purpose for the right outcome. So a study that was you know, sponsored by Humana and the University of Pittsburgh late last year, um, looked at you know, basically healthcare in general from a spend perspective, indicated that we've got almost a trillion dollars that we waste per year. But the most important thing from my perspective is down at the bottom, it relates that, you know, because of lack of data interoperability, 25% of that is directly attributable. So $191 billion to $282 billion a year are not spent efficiently or wasted based upon our ability to do, to do interoperability and integration the way that we need to do it. Next slide, please. I'm going to quickly go through a couple of you know, definitions. I know that everybody on the call knows what interoperability is, but I want to make sure that as I go into some of the subjects as it relates to fire and some contemporary technology, that we have a distinction between what integration is or what data exchange is and what interoperability is. And I'm going to predicate that with the fact that the goal, I think, at least for myself and probably everybody on the call here today, is to move integrated care delivery forward, right? So that the right information is available at the right time, usually with the clinician, right when it's needed for the right outcome. And I know this slot, this picture on the right side is extremely simplistic, 
right? In the sense that we've got, you know, a consumer, a provider, a health plan, and we've got third parties wrapping around it. And then we've got some type of nexus in the middle. Uh, and what I'm trying to represent with this is the fact that all of those constituents coming together and sharing information appropriately is what we're talking about when we refer to integrated care delivery, right? Making sure the right information is available at the right time. And I know this, this picture is almost simplistic in nature, but 10 years ago, it was unthinkable in the sense that we would have consumer mediations and providers and health plans coming together to agree on use cases. And then we'd have a technology such as fire and some of the adjacent technologies such as smart on fire to drive this forward. So it's actually quite an exciting time. And for those of you that have been doing interoperability and integration for a long time, I'm sure you, you probably share my excitement as well. And I'm gonna repeat this a couple of times today, but you know, what's driving this forward? You know, we've had technology, we've had RESTful APIs, you know, we've had healthcare for a long time. You know, what's moving this forward? And the fact that we need integrated care delivery, I've talked about that. We've got some regulatory mandates that are in play now with the CMS and ONC rule. We got industry groups that are coming together to agree that we don't need to compete on technology and we need to agree on protocols and use cases. Uh, we can distinguish ourselves with the data insights that we share, but, uh, but competing on the underlying protocols makes no sense. And then increasingly empowered consumers, you know, given the fact that I'm going to get my dramatic prop here, that, you know, patients and members with these devices are increasingly becoming empowered as it relates to sharing information. And to use those types of devices, contemporary inter interoperability such as RESTful APIs are critical. Next slide, please. And I think everybody's familiar with what data exchange is, but for the purpose of today's discussion, data exchange really means put, taking data from point A and moving it to point B. There's really not thought about reusability, reusability or standards. It's basically data movement. If we contrast that on the next slide with what interoperability is. Interoperability is different. Although it is a subsection of data exchange, it basically means that we're, we're sharing information in a coordinated manner across organizational boundaries. And the most important part is that it's predicated on industry standards and reusability. So build it once, reuse it as much as you can. So that message is going to be uh, just reinforced throughout today's session uh, when we talk about the use cases and also the technology. What we're trying to do is remove excess costs and inefficiencies by rebuilding things whenever we do a new connection. And I know that folks that, that live in the world of information networks live and breathe this in a daily, on a daily basis. And again, um, as you can tell, I like my crayon or my crayonic you know, slides that we have here. Uh, this is one of a couple that you're gonna see today. And uh, although it's very simple, it does describe what we're trying to get to. So for example, on the left, I uh, think of those cars, trucks, van, uh, the, the bus, the motor scooter, the, the van in the lower left corner of the car as functional use cases, some data payload or some use case that needs to go from the clinic on the left side to the health plan or the hospital system on the right side, right? Um, it's small scale that works because the cars can go from left to right and right to left. I should say functional use cases, but unfortunately they've all built their own roadway, which doesn't work. Now, if we contrast that to what we're trying to get to at scale with fire in the lower right corner, we've got the same vehicles that we have in the upper left, but we're now sharing an agreed upon framework for exchange. We've got, you know, a roadway, we've got lights, we've got an off ramp, we've got lines in the middle of the road, and we're able to smoothly put additional use cases on there and uh, move information in a nice orderly way. So just kind of remember this, you know, this metaphor analogy or whatever, this visual as we go to today's discussion. Um, next slide, please. And again, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, just another setup slide. And um, I like to draw analogies to other industries, right? Because in healthcare, um, we are certainly held to a higher level of, you know, burden when it comes to security and fidelity of information as it relates to, you know, private health information and PI and whatever the case may be. But that doesn't mean that we can't borrow from other industries to try to drive simple and easy experiences. So I'm going to refer to e-commerce a couple of times today because it has become so, you know, part of our day-to-day our -day life and it's so easy to use that I like to draw parallels between what we do from an e-commerce perspective uh, versus what we do from a healthcare perspective, because we can share models and we can share technology as it relates to some of the fire, I'm sorry, the RESTful APIs in those models as well. But you know, again, I'm not gonna read the slide to you, but you can understand things that we're talking about, member control, improved savings, you know, coordinated care experiences, things that should be part of our model um, that haven't been historically, but are going to be enabled by some of the technology that I'm gonna refer to today. 
Okay, so let's, you know, a quick refresher, and I think, you know, folks on the call probably don't need it, but, you know, uh, when we talk about healthcare integration, I typically break it down into three buckets. We got the classic world of administrative transactions, and those are typically HIPAA-based transactions and run on uh, the X12, you know, model in the, their claims, their prior authorizations, their eligibility benefits, thing that, uh, um, transactions that basically run the administrative side of the world, right? Um, and those are, you know, run lights out to very, very mature technology. It does what it needs to do, but it doesn't provide all the things that we need to be successful today when it comes to in workflow integration and ease of use. We've also got in the middle what we, you know, clinical interoperability. I think folks on the phone are extremely familiar with this. You know, the HL7V2, the ADT, CCDs, ORUs, everything that constitutes uh, traditional HL7 interoperability. But primarily for today's discussion, we're gonna talk about contemporary integration with a fire and associated approaches. And the reason we're focusing on this is that I wanna make sure that we have a good distinction on what is different between uh, fire um, and, you know, and fire -like type technologies and things that we've done historically, right? What does it enable? What does it do that we couldn't do in previous models? And again, uh, you know, the healthcare evolution, I think we've covered this. Again, trying to drive integrated care delivery, providers, consumers, health plans, caregivers, others that are uh, need to share information so that things are available at the right time to drive the things forward. And a key concept, again, is the fact that these are interoperability stakeholders. Up until the last couple of years, we probably didn't think of consumers or members as key interoperability stakeholders. But the way, with the evolution you know, of fire and the fact that a lot of large companies are getting into healthcare as it relates to you know, mobile apps and caregiver apps and health plans and providers are sharing information. And with the CMS rule, it's required that we share it with consumers and other payers. This is, this is coming together organically and we need to make sure that we're prepared so that we have the best results for everybody. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is where, for those of you that are like super technical, it's going to get a little bit, uh, I don't know, weird for a couple of slides, but let's just walk through this. But before I jump into what FIRE is and the types of things that it enables, just a really quick, you know, discussion on what an API is. Again, if you're a developer, you know, uh, you're, you're, you may be offended by how simple I'm going to make this. But for the purposes of the overall audience, an API um, is, is really not new. We've been dealing with APIs since the 70s for those of us that have been coding a long time, not me personally, but uh, maybe somebody on the phone who may have been around that long. Uh, but what we're talking about for today's purposes is typically web-based APIs. And an API from the perspective of today's discussion is really nothing more than a, you know, a piece of software that allows communication between two actors or two systems, right? When I say actor, I don't necessarily mean a human, but between apps or two servers or two, uh, whatever you know, the case may be. That's really what it is. Basically a software and hardware mechanism to share information. And I'm going to take a journey outside of healthcare to show how APIs have revolutionized or the API economy or the API mindset have revolutionized other industries and how that's starting to happen in healthcare. And to do that, let's talk about e-commerce, because uh, if you're like me, I tend to use e-commerce sites. I'm not going to give any names, but when I need to buy socks or shoes or shirts or whatever the case may be, it's typically three clicks for me, you know, color, size, and buy. And since my wardrobe is quite simple and I always buy the same color socks, it's even quicker, right? It typically takes me about 35 seconds to, to, uh, to get my socks. I usually buy in packs of, you know, seven or eight or 10 or whatever it is. And then they show up two days later, right? Very easy experience, 35 seconds, maybe a minute, and then I'm done. That was all driven by APIs under the covers. So for example, when I clicked on buy, the API went over to my bank to make sure that I had $14.95 to pay for it. An API went over to the warehouse to make sure it was in stock. An API you know, went to the shipping company, UPS, FedEx, uh, the postal service, whatever, to make sure that they could get to me, they could get it to me in two days. Again, a single you know, user interface on the glass for me, but behind the scenes, APIs across multiple systems made that experience nice for me. Um, and you can talk about open table, you can talk about social media, whatever the case may be, pick your own use case. But compare that to what we do in healthcare, for example, with prior authorization, in which it takes 17 to 18 minutes, results in phone calls, fax machines, profanity, you know, post-it notes around your screen to figure out, you know, what, what certain organizations require. That's the distinction. That's what we're trying to 
um, make sure that, or try to bring that type of model to healthcare where it's a nice, easy, integrated experience in the EHR or some other workflow system. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that we've talked about, you know, what an API is at a super duper high level, let's talk about what FHIR is and why it's different than some of the other models that we use in healthcare. Uh, and I'm not saying it's better, I'm just saying it has different enablers than what we do from an administrative perspective and what we do from a clinical, uh, you know, historical interoperability perspective. So if we boil this down, and, and honestly, I could talk for three hours on this slide, and you know, specifically, but Spencer and Shelby told me only had 45 minutes, so I'm going to go pretty quickly here, is that, you know, FHIR, you know, at its most basic level is an API and an information model for healthcare. So you get what an API is because we talked about it a few slides ago, but it also has a nice information model that we're going to, to walk through at a high level in a few slides. That's what it basically brings to healthcare. So as opposed to us trying to figure out, hey, what API are you gonna use? Let's you know, spend six months or a year negotiating you know, what the interaction is gonna look like or looking at very complex sequence diagrams or looking at classic SOAP XML models that we use in administrative side of the worlds the ability to understand what a RESTful API is because they're typically fairly easy to deal with. And we're gonna see a few examples in a minute. I mean, also an information model that has been through industry review. And those of us that you know participate in HL7, and I suspect a lot of you guys on the phone are probably participating in HL7. Um, we all agree that what the RESTful API model is gonna look like and what the information model is gonna look like, it goes through a balloting process, we agree, and then we don't have to negotiate on how we're gonna exchange information. That's why on the right side, you see this nice little picture with a lot of folks, you know, providers, um, you know, uh, re uh, research, public health, um, whatever the case may be, pick your actor on there, all being enabled by a common HL7 FIRE framework. A couple of things that they that Fire brings that are different from some of the other technologies that we use um, is the, the fact of ease of onboarding. Typically, RESTful APIs, especially if they've been agreed to across the industry, are fairly easy to onboard. I don't have to have 15 phone calls with my partner to figure out what the RESTful API does. If their API is to spec or their, rest, their server is to spec, it's an easy integration for me because I don't have to have intimate knowledge of how their systems operate. I only need to understand that they support the fire model. Also, some of the things that, and we're gonna see this towards the end, the fact that using these RESTful contemporary models allows us to do thing in things in native workflow that we were not able to do with our other technologies because they just didn't lend themselves to that. So when I talk about literally an app running inside of an EHR that's connecting the EHR to the payer or to a health information network or to something, uh, HIE or whatever in real time directly on the glass is a distinguishing factor from what we were able to do previously. Next slide, please. Okay, so you know, I think we've, we've covered a lot of this. We figured out what an API is. Uh, we've talked about you know, what FHIR is. Again, a, just a, a slightly different representation. Um, typically on this slide, I talk about why FHIR is different um, and how it enables you know, easier onboarding because you don't have to have a not intimate knowledge of a remote thing. You just need to understand how FHIR works. Um, and also the fact that it supports in workflow integration. So I think um, you know, one of the things that I will call out because you know, listen to Jason's a previous uh, um, presentation, social determinants of health. You'll see in the lower left corner on the right side there, uh, the fact that from a fire model and from a fire API perspective, all of these things are in play, including SDOH. So the fact that we have a group, um, a basically a what we call an HL7 accelerator called the Gravity Project, that is specifically um, come together around SDOH use cases and agreeing that they're gonna use the same technology that we use for value-based care and everything else in healthcare with FHIR is an example of a technology supporting multiple use cases and multiple, um, you know, multiple domains on top of it. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that we've you know, talked uh, you know, about technical connectivity, I think hopefully you know, we're about 19 minutes into the presentation. I know we're going at breakneck speed, but you probably have an understanding of what FHIR means, right? FHIR is the technical uh, framework that connects healthcare as it relates to contemporary interoperability, or it's becoming that. I shouldn't, sometimes I talk aspirationally, healthcare or FHIR is becoming an adopted standard. It's not universal as of yet, but you can see on the left side, it's got a lot of potential. And with the CMS and ONC rules, which are starting to mandate its usage, 
um, we expect that it's going to continue to grow and it's going to start connecting people in ways that I've already covered. But not only is it a technical connectivity model, but it also brings together folks from a community perspective. I know that sounds kind of weird. How does technology bring a community together? Well, let me explain that a little bit. Um, now that we have a technology that we don't have to bicker about how we're going to use, we can focus on things such as use cases per domain, right? So we're not, we're not trying to rehash the underlying technology every time. Let's focus on real functionality. For example, Project Gravity in the, in the kind of the one o'clock position uh, on the right side of the screen focuses on social determinants of health. The Argonaut Project, which I guess is at three o'clock on the right side over there, focuses on things such as core data services for EHRs. Again, it uses the same technology that Gravity is using, but it just focuses on different things. Da Vinci Project, you know, at about the five o'clock position, I guess, focuses on value-based care. So connecting providers and payers. Uh, again, not uh, agreeing to use the HL7 technology, just like everybody else in the sphere, but focusing on a specific domain. Karen Alliance in the seven o'clock position, I guess, um, focuses on things such as consumer mediation, you know, using mobile devices, these things to ensure that, uh, that consumers are in charge of their medication. And there's also Codex, which focuses on cancer initiatives and those types of things. And the list could go on and on, and I probably missed a couple on here, but you get, you get the idea that um, the underlying technology allows the community to focus from a use case perspective. Next slide, please. Just really, really quickly, because sometimes um, we get questions, you know, uh, hey, Patrick, why fire now? Why, why is it, what's the, you know, why is this a magic time for healthcare and our operability, right? Healthcare has existed, you know, since the beginning of time. Um, we've been, you know, trying to integrate for many, many years. What's different now? And I like to call this an inflection point. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why this is you know, moving forward. I think for one reason is the industry has grown up a little bit and we recognize that things that we've historically competed on don't need to be competed on, right? Such as protocols for exchange of information, right? Other industries gave up on that type of competition years ago. Um, but we recognize as an industry that enabling integrated care delivery across the spectrum is a way to move the ball forward, right? Making sure that we have the right data at the right place with the right clinicians for the right outcome. And so that folks are not hunting for data. It's not a complete reset Every time you go to a physician, they have no ability to have your historical records. You, or you go from, you know, one payer, one insurance company to another insurance company. In today's world, it's like, you know, deleting your history, right? Uh, in the brave world of fire, that information can go with you. So the fact that we want to make sure that we're integrated across the spectrum, the shift to value-based care, the fact that the fact that insurers and payers, I'm sorry, insurers and uh, providers have to work together to ensure that both are being accountable to each other and making sure that we're bringing the entire population up collectively from a, you know, from a health outcomes perspective. Um, the fact that we've got industry initiatives, the use case teams that I talked about on the prior slide, given that CMS and ONC have, have, have adopted this model as well. And so the latest rules on uh, interoperability and information blocking, uh, or patient access API, I should say, from CMS, clearly indicates that the FHIR standard is the standard going forward for the exchange of consumer-mediated and other types of data. Um, and, I, and I could also go on for the technical folks on the call here. I'm sure I wouldn't take much for me to convince you that building RESTful APIs in that type of technology stack is less expensive to build and maintain over time. Uh, for those of you that have had the joy of working with SOAP XML and other types of integration technologies, uh, understand that those can be very expensive to maintain given their complexity. And trust me, I've been around the world or been around the block when it comes to interop. I build my fair share of SOAP XML and X12 connectors and even socket connections and implemented you know, the IET profiles and those, those types of things. Um, all good, good, good stuff but they can be difficult and expensive to maintain over time. What we're trying to get to from a fire perspective is build it once um, and you know, keep it over time, use standard versioning that we use in the rest of our model. And you've got an asset that can live you know, into the future without tight coupling across entities and um, uh, basically facilitating ease of use. The other thing really, really quickly, because I tend to forget this, is data liberation, democratization and liquidity. I know buzzwords, but the fact that with APIs, that organically drives the need for data liberation because now that you have a mechanism for sharing data, you've got to liberate it from some of those underlying platforms. And when we get in some of the architectural patterns here in a minute, I'm going to drive into that a little bit further. But in the meantime, 
Um, let's go ahead and go forward and go into that slide that I've been waiting to come up here. I know this is a little bit of an eye chart and I apologize for this, but I wanna go over a couple of key concepts and I'm gonna go through a, you know, a couple of things here and see how this relates to the worlds that you live in and, and maybe you can take some of this for your own benefit. Um, when we talk about key concepts of fire, I know some folks in the prone are probably experts from this perspective, uh, but for those of you that, you know, may know what fire is and are coming up to speed on it, you know, some of the key concepts, I'm not going to go into great detail, the fact that you've got things such as structure definitions. I talked about the information model and, um, you know, and that's what we're talking about. How do we bring things together from an information uh, model perspective to put the Lego blocks together to build things that we need from a patient perspective, medication, observation, or whatever the case may be. So FIRE very much uses the Lego model. Um, I probably shouldn't say that's a little bit demeaning, but you know the fact that uh, it, we're, it basically provides base resources, which build on each other. So if you look in kind of in the middle at the, you know, the, the FIRE composition framework, you see the foundational resources, and then the base resources, then clinical, financial. So you know, building, you know, getting the bricks at the bottom that, that hold the building up, and then putting the bricks together in a way that we can build things that are usable from a machine and a human perspective. Capability statements are nothing more than, hey, as a fire user, I'm telling the world this is what I support so that I don't have to make a phone call. I can read your fire implementation and figure out, you know, search parameters are fairly obvious. The domain model I've talked about a little bit. Um, also extensions, the fact that, you know, as, as good as fire is, guess what? We're going to come up with something that doesn't fit natively in a fire resource or something that you need for, for a specific use case that may not be universal. Um, so the model is extensible if, it, if we need to extend it. Extensible so that those that like the, they can use the extensions can, and those that don't want to use the extensions can ignore them. And of course, the fact that we support profiles. And profiles, if you think about the Lego blocks that I talked about, profiles are basically, you know, the top layer in which we're bringing things together um, and building up fire resources so that they serve a specific need, such as a U.S. healthcare patient or U.S. healthcare uh, medication list, as opposed to a European or, or, or something like that, or some specific use case that basically orchestrates across, you know, different, you know, fire, uh, fire resources. And for, and I'm going pretty quickly here, but um, let's talk about approaches because we all know that we have applications and systems today that have worked for many, many years, right? And guess what? Just because you have fire doesn't mean you can convert everything in the world to fire overnight. So there are basically three approaches to this. And, and given you know, the fact that you know, the health information networks are, are coming into the fire space, I think this is important to talk about. You know, the three approaches that, that, that I uh, see are you know, basically fire enabling an existing platform, which means that, hey, you've got a, a platform X that's doing something. How can we make changes around it um, or changes to it so that it can support fire, right? Do you need to refactor the database? Do you need to put adapters or connectors on top of it? Um, so fire enabling an existing platform is something that is, uh, you know, certainly something that can be considered. And if you're, you know, doing an EHR or something like that, that probably is the approach that you're going to take because you need to fire enable that. Um, but for outside of that, those specific things, um, the, the bottom two are probably more appropriate. So for example, fire abstraction, and this is one that's, you know, being in the, in the, on the insurance or the payer side of the world is, is quite uh, appealing to us in the sense that we have applications which, you know, do certain things that they typically have APIs, but they're not necessarily fire APIs. So the ability to put adapters around those applications so they can send and receive fire messages through some layer um, without having to understand the nuances of fire internally. So that's a very, very valid pattern or approach. Um, and that's something that my organization has adopted. Uh, also a fire enterprise health data platform. This is basically one in which you say, you know, we've got fire, um, let's turn it into our enterprise platform, right? Let's basically have fire become our enterprise API model and our enterprise information model. Um, although that does certainly have its place in today's world and probably will become more prevalent over time, that's a, a bigger a bigger lift. Unless you're doing something net new in which you can go fire enabled out of the gate, that's probably a bit, bigger lift. So I think if I had to guess, most organizations are going with the fire abstraction layer at this point. And we'll give you a couple of examples of that as, we're, as we go through the, the, the following slides. From an architectural pattern perspective, there's a couple and I've, I've got some really ugly pictures on the right side that I'm not really proud of, but they help to describe you know, what happens in the different models. 
And these align a little bit with the approaches that I just talked about. For example, you know, a fire interoperability interface or broker. And this is the one uh, kind of there on the right side uh, in the middle, it says fire interface. And that's where somebody's interacting with you via fire, which is a very, very common pattern. And then under that, you've got a fire server or a fire adapter, and then a data access layer and a data layer. So in that model, you've adopted the fire API and you're exchanging information via the API and the information model, but your underlying data may not be fire native. Right. And that's a very common pattern today in the sense that you may do mapping or transformation in flight. And as it's going to rest, it may go into a proprietary data model so that the operational systems can use it. Another very common pattern is the fire mixed, which is in the upper right corner. And that's where you've got an interoperability platform, which can talk fire for those that are fire enabled. But it can also talk other, you know, I hate to use the word proprietary, but because it just sounds so nasty, but you know, maybe a non-fire adapter or RESTful API, which has a lot of value, but hasn't been converted to fire as of yet, you're still using the same interop platform when that does fire and also supports other things. You've got a fire server to, you know, process those fire transactions and you've got a non-fire adapter, which again, brokers the communication to the data layer, right? So in this model, you're running fire, but you're also, you don't necessarily have an underlying data structure that is native fire. And then the, the model in the lower right corner is the fire repository integration hub or analytics. I kind of grouped a lot together. And that's basically in which you've got, you know, fire services, as we see, you know, kind of on the left side of that screen there, that's running on a fire server uh, with, uh, or, or an adapter. We've got non-fire, but we've also got a fire clinical repository. Again, I talked about the fire, that, the fact that fire is an, but it's also an information model. So in the lower right corner, you're doing, you're doing fire APIs but you're also doing fire natively as well. So you're persisting information as fire. Um, you're converting maybe X12 or V2, CCDAs or whatever into fire. I know that some people on the phone, their heads are probably spinning around. He's like, what? You're converting this into fire. And I get your initial reaction. Some of the positive things about that, and if I've, I've actually implemented this model in my organization with great benefit because it allows you to represent data in a single format regardless of how it was generated in remote systems. So if you got something that came in as via an ORU and you know in an HL7 V2 message, you got something that came in a, a lab in a proprietary format, uh, you may have something from a claim, you know, an X12 message. Wow, you're gonna do data discovery across all three of those. But if you spend the time to coerce that or transform that into a fire model, then you can do analytics across the spectrum, regardless of how the information got to you. Okay, I know that was a lot of info there. I'm gonna reinforce some of this over the next couple of slides, but I know we're getting tight on time. Shelby, so if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. And again, for those of you that are, are fire uh, savvy, uh, close your eyes for a second because this is, is so basic. But what I wanted to show here is, you know, you know, fire from an underlying uh, construct is not difficult. So if you're looking at the screen here, if you've ever you've seen a patient represented in any other format, you're gonna recognize exactly what's happening here in the sense that we've got you know, name, gender, blah, 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 blah. We've also got some additional things such as identifier, which is specific to fire. We're not gonna get into that level of detail today, but the information model that we use in fire is although it's contemporary and it uses JSON, which you know is very flexible and very powerful, it can also be XML as well. But we typically there's not a lot of folks that uh, I'm, I'm sorry I shouldn't say that JSON is is probably the the prevalent uh, matter or prevalent way to represent the data, the information model in Fire, although it can be XML as well. My point here is that um, it's not a foreign language, so I would encourage you after the call here. I provided a link in the left corner. Click that. Not now, Shelby, but you know when when the folks you know do it uh, when they get this on the the Wova app, they can click on it, and you can just do some self discovery. Go out and and experiment with some of these resources. Look like I think you'll be surprised how familiar you are with the data. If we could go over to the next slide, please. So um, what I've got here is just some examples, and again, I, I'm not trying to turn this into a like a super technical meeting, um, but to give you an idea, because I know that we've got some, you know, some engineers and developers on the call here that are probably fam very familiar with XDS, uh, AHE, and some of the other profiles and, and that type of thing that we all grew up in. Um, but I would also encourage you, you know, if you're familiar with, you know, REST and, and APIs in general, a lot of the material that we see here from a fire operations and a fire search, just things that I pulled off the HL7 site, 
uh, to give you an idea of how you, you, would, you would basically interact with the fire server is something that I would encourage you to do. So for example, you see basically a claim submit in the upper left corner. So those that are familiar with you know, how a URI works, that probably looks very familiar to you. Um, also, you, know, you see that the second one there, we're a dollar to sign everything operation. That's basically a, a, a post to get information back. Uh, again, don't wanna go into great detail here, but I would encourage you to go check this out. Um, also in the lower left, you've, you've got you know, some uh, additional search operations. For example, you know, the, the one on the, the get you know, with some different values and stuff like that. And the last one is basically searching for a patient with an ID of, of 23. Um, again, not to, to distract you with these little details, but go do some discovery. And what I'd like to do is ask Shelby, if you could, Shelby, if you could put those links that are on the right side into the chat. Um, and again, these are super duper simplistic um, fire interactions. So if you're an expert in fire, don't waste your time on doing these. But if you'd like to see, you know, how you do a, a, a basically a get on a fire server and get a little bit of fake information back, um, please don't do this during my presentation unless you've got two monitors. But uh, if you want to, you know, go basically do a patient search, uh, patient number one, do, do an observation search on observation number one, you'll actually get to the JSON back through your Chrome browser, your Edge browser, or Firefox, or Safari, whatever you use. So feel free to do some discovery there. Um, again, we're not expecting humans to be able to read the JSON. It would show up in app or something like that, but it at least gives you a little bit of flavor of what interacting with the fire server looks like. Next slide, please. And I'm going to pick up a little bit of speed here. I know that we've only got you know a little bit less than 10 minutes, so we can save some time for questions. But you know, I've talked about fire, I've talked about APIs and all that kind of stuff. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how this is starting to surface in the world of healthcare that we all live in. The first thing is that, I um, mean, I know most folks are probably very familiar with it, that the CMS and ONC rules, which became final a couple of months ago, basically require that FHIR be used for the exchange of certain information as relates to the patient access API, the payer to payer exchange. So FHIR is basically the standard that has been mandated by those rules. The ONC rule does something similar for, um, you know, for the, from the EHR side of the world and also from uh, other types of you know, thir uh, certified third party developers or certified IT developers, I should say. So the fact that you know, from a mandate and a regulatory perspective, the push is towards FHIR only as is, is kind of a forcing function to you know, basically move the ball forward. Now, uh, to be transparent, we've reduced about 962 pages of federal regulations into a single PowerPoint. So, um, but you hopefully you get the idea that what they're trying to drive here is member empowerment, standards-based, open APIs, translation, fire, uh, care coordination across payers and providers. That's basically saying a component of integrated care delivery and innovation. Innovation is not something we've historically done well in healthcare. Jason was talking about it on the previous one as it relates to you know, some of the work that he's doing with you know, data science and that type of thing. But the fact that um, as innovation has occurred in other industries, the fact that we've got a common framework for APIs, we're anticipating that a lot of third-party developers will come along and provide apps that help members and providers and others manage their information. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, you know, I'm just going to go really, really quickly through this because I want folks to look at it, and then I'm going to draw a parallel to my organization. But hopefully, by now, you get a good picture of what fire is. In the lower left corner, you see this green bar, which is basically, uh, you know, a, a fire-based model, and it's connecting all the different entities. We've got providers, we've got patients, uh, we've got labs, and we've got you know, payers, the host hospitals, the host spectrum. Okay, so that again is another representation of what we're trying to do from an interoperability perspective. On the right side, we've got some use cases, right? So we've got the fire framework, and then we put use cases on top, on top of that. We talked about it in a second. Those are some examples of what we're doing from a DaVinci perspective, from a Care and Alliance perspective. And at the top, we've also got the Fire at Scale Task Force, which I'm going to cover in a second. But for the purpose of, of moving forward, let's go ahead and go to the next slide so I can drive through some of these. So we talked about, you know, you see the green bar there. Now let me tell you about my organization, just so you have a frame of reference. So the green bar that you saw on the previous slide is, you know, kind of that interoperability framework is a, has an analog that we see here in the sense that in my organization, we have this interoperability platform, which is able to talk to our classic, you know, operational platforms. So it's using the model of, you know, basically facade 
It is, you know, transforming information in real time between fire and other formats so that the operational platforms don't have to understand fire on their own. We abstract that one layer up so that our interoperability platform handles all of that. And it's then able to communicate to the outside world via the consumer journey or provider journey or whatever, whatever experience channel is needed, right? Be it an EHR, consumer app, whatever the case may be and not have to uh, refactor the underlying operating platforms to do that. So do the interoperability platform as a centralized, uh, although it's not a central technology, it's federated of course, but uh, in cloud native of course, but it allows us to basically provide a single framework, Firebase to serve information up and out through the organization. So it can be requested from us and we can also respond back or push information out. Next slide, please. You know, I think for the interest of time, given that we only got a couple of minutes, I'm going to go through this really, really quickly and talk about two industry consortiums. The first is uh, the Fire at Scale Task Force, right? And the Fire at Scale Task Force is an ONC initiative in which several, you know, of, of us in healthcare have come together to make sure that we're dealing with items um, from a scalability solution. So, for example, how do we do testing and certification? How do we ensure that transactions can route across intermediaries, right? How do we discover others' endpoints? Do we need a directory service so that, you know, a, a Dr. A can, you know, basically talk to Dr. B without making a phone call to figure out the name of his fire server or whatever the case may be? So the, ONC, the, the Fire at Scale Task Force is a basically a group that many of us participate in that focus on scalability issues. Next slide, please. And what we see here is just an example of, you know, one of those scalability issues. For example, if you've got an intermediary such as an HIE or a clearinghouse, the ability to route transactions across that. Because in in, in, from an API perspective, uh, many of us tend to think of that as a, you know, a direct communication, meaning you've got, you know, a, a server here and a server here. I'll leave, yeah, here and here. And we're trying to share information between the two. But in healthcare, we know that we have inter intermediaries. So transactions may take several hops. So having the ability to have enough information in the RESTful havers to share that information or to make sure that information routes is, is pretty critical. Next slide, please. Yep, I think for the purpose of time, I'm not gonna drive into this. It, it would take a little bit of time. And I think it's more important that we go ahead and go forward, Shelby. So if you can go to the next slide, and let me quickly walk through the fact that we've talked about the, the scalability issues, let's talk about some functional, functional use cases. So if we can go ahead and talk about, you know, the, the DaVinci project is one in which, and I mentioned it a couple slides ago, in which we've come together from a, um, the perspective of how do we remove abrasions from provider payer relationships to make sure that we're sharing information appropriately. So if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, these are some of the use cases that we're, or I'm sorry, these are some of the players I should say, as you can tell, there's, there's quite a few, uh, you know, organizations, prominent organizations from a payer's perspective, EHRs, providers. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but, you know, the fact that uh, it has a fairly good pedigree when it comes to folks that are participating and developing those use cases. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the use cases that the DaVinci Project is working on. Um, you know, um, I'm going to give you a quick example of burden reduction, but the fact that quality improvement, how do we get the right information to the right folks for reporting, member access, again, how do we make sure that using devices such as, as these and EHRs, we're able to get clinical data and payer data to the right place to serve those use cases. Uh, clinical data exchange is another one. How do we make it uh, so that uh, provider or payers can request information from providers? process improvement, and um, maybe we'll drive this home with the, the prior authorization use case, which is one of my personal favorites. So if we could go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is one in which, you know, we've talked about, I mentioned earlier, prior authorization. It typically results in about a 17 to 18 minute out of band process, which means that somebody drops out of their EHR system. They log into a web portal, they make a phone call, uh, whatever, they use a fax machine, carrier pigeon, whatever technology to try to figure out if a service is authorized for a specific patient. Um, but with contemporary interoperability, we can bring that into the work so, workflow so that the first step is when we see that an order is taking place, we use an API behind the scenes that goes to check the insurance company to see what they require. Do they require you know, prior authorizations or anything special that they need? And as opposed to that being a phone call, that's a, basically an app or a CDS hook that pops up directly in the workflow, right? And then if there is additional information needed, there is a template that pops up directly in the EHR 
so that it can try to get information outside of the from it from the EHR and also ask the providers directly, you know, the types of information that's needed right there in the workflow without a phone call or logging to a web portal. And the third one is actually submitting the authorization. So this entire process goes from about 17 to 18 minutes down to about, you know, two minutes. So pretty big improvement, all in workflow, all in band. And I think for the purpose of the time, I know we got a few slides here left, but let's go ahead and if there's any questions or, or comments, if there's none. Yeah, I think we're okay. Um, and yet we are at time. So that, that was a great presentation, Patrick. Obviously, we have there's a lot of expertise here and our attendees are gonna have a lot to digest. Um, but as we said before, this recording will be available later. And hopefully with these slides, if that's okay with you, Patrick, that we provide those on the Whova app for our attendees. Absolutely, yeah. And I would encourage people, I know you're gonna cut me off, but if you could just go to the last slide, we yeah. didn't get to my, my key learnings, but uh, there are some learnings being having been on this journey for a long time. This is just a synopsis. Um, if you're just starting on the journey um, or thinking about the journey, um, learn from those of us that have, have been through the, the mud, so to speak. <laughs> So, and that's cool. And also just before I turn over, I would encourage folks, I see Dr. Vet Nguyen is coming up next. This guy is not only as a physician, he's an absolute rock star when it comes to interoperability. So I encourage you to stay on and hear what uh, Dr. Viet has got to say. <laughs>